G'day guys, welcome back to the Truth Footy YouTube channel for uh, an impromptu trade update. I made videos uh, last night sort of mapping out what's happened in the trade period so far and what is likely to happen in week two and this was based on the premise that there were going to be no deals done over the weekend uh, and that may still be true uh, because what we've heard reported is that Tyler Brockman uh, is going to head to the West Coast Eagles. Whether or not the paperwork has been formally lodged, I'm not sure, but it's been reported as though it's a done deal. West Coast have put him all over their social media. so. Uh, I don't know if that means trades can happen this weekend, but it certainly seems like they can. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This video is going to be uh, taking a little look at West Coast trade period so far. I do think the bulk of the business that we're going to do is done. Um, for context, we've had about uh, a thousand new subscribers in the last month. So first of all, thank you to those who've joined the channel. I really, really appreciate it. But if you aren't aware of this channel or haven't been for a very long time, um, basically I am going to be continuing all these trade content, regular general AFL content, and obviously mapping out the trade period as it happens and that will continue through the draft but uh, if you didn't know I'm a huge Eagles fan and every now and then I do a Eagles focused video. So this one is going to be uh, sort of about how the West Coast have gone about this trade period so far and talking a little bit about the two new recruits in Tyler Brockman and Matthew Flynn. So we'll start with Tyler Brockman obviously that is the fresh news. Uh, the last thing that I had reported on this channel was that the Eagles had offered pick 44 for Brockman that got subsequently rejected by Hawthorne. Now West Coast did have the uh, upper hand in this because we have pick one in the preseason draft and while that may have been an empty threat I don't know uh, how seriously we were going to do that we still somehow improved the offer by offering 44 and 63 so that's what Hawthorne got out of this deal 63 to us is worth absolutely nothing uh, because we really aren't going to be taking picks that late uh, so we gave up 44 and change. Hawthorne, I presume, are going to have some use for pick 63. Not really too sure what yet, other than, you know, matching um, some bids. Well, they've got two GF as well. So they've got a father-son in Will McCabe that's likely to go top 20. And then they've got uh, Chankuth GF's little brother, who is also a Next Generation Academy talent. So may maybe this is about accumulating points for that. Maybe we have held them out a little bit, but either way, no skin off our nose um, and we add a small pressure forward I like the look of Tyler Brockman um, it's one of those ones where the club he's leaving seems to really really rate him which is um, usually the case it's, that is typical to be honest with a trade period when a, when a player is leaving a club suddenly the way that he is rated at that club inflates or at least by the fans and then um, the team that's receiving him you know it's a psychological thing you don't think he's worth much before he enters your club and now that he's there you kind of start to think it's a bargain and he's going to be a best 22 player so the truth is always somewhere in the middle but in fairness um, you know Brockman does seem to actually be rated by Hawthorne this isn't a case of him running out of opportunity or him not getting a contract at Hawthorne. This is a case of him having a young family back in Western Australia um, and needing to uh, be at home and have the support necessary. So in a way, we have benefited from that circumstance. And obviously, hopefully, we provide an environment where he can, um, you know, have a good life for a start and also play some good footy. So Brockman joins West Coast. There has been a connection between Brockman and West Coast for, you know, three years now. Uh, back in 2020, uh, I, was, I was doing a little bit of research and we were actually linked to him a lot in articles prior to the 2020 draft. Uh, the Eagles entered the draft in like the 50s that year or something like that. And uh, Brockman, it was expected to be around that range. Hawthorne re reportedly shocked Brockman. He was surprised to learn that they had drafted him with pick 46 um, and West Coast had to readjust. And I think in that draft, we took Izzy Winder. And also, I think we took Luke Edwards that year as well. So we missed out on Brockman, but we get our man in the end. So um, the Eagles sort of were clearly on the, on the hunt back in that draft for a sort of medium forward, small forward, uh, potentially someone who runs through the midfield as well, can provide a bit of pressure. We took Izzy Winder. Now, Izzy Winder, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to assess exactly how his AFL career really should have progressed because he got into a bit of strife. Uh, was it last year? This year? I can't remember. There was some off-field stuff where he, you know, he got um, charged with assault. He ended up getting off, um, and that might have been the end of his career there. And then the other thing about him from a playing perspective was that as much as we wanted him to be this goal-scoring forward, he did an okay job of that. He really was a midfielder in a forward's body. And that's the trick you see a little bit with um, with sometimes small forwards. They're, they're midfielders who get sort of shoehorned into a forward role and they don't quite have the attributes to make it at AFL level. They might have the physique and the attributes to be a midfielder at waffle level. And uh, I, I do wonder if, if Winder was one of those players 
as an aside, Noah Long is probably the opposite example of someone who was too small to make it as a midfielder, started playing forward in his junior year, and then actually turned out to be a very crafty forward. So we got lucky with Noah Long. Uh, but the difference here with Brockman is that I think this is actually a, a genuine player who is, is suited to the forward line. Now, to, to temper some expectations, I don't think Brockman is going to come in and be you know, a 50-goal-a-year small forward or anything like that. I think what we can expect from him is... He's a very busy player, uh, lots of energy around the contest. Uh, I like what I see from a, from a pressure point of view. His numbers at AFL level, the kid is only 20 years old. Uh, he's got a late birthday, same birthday as me, shout out. So he's still only 20. Um, so his numbers at AFL level might not be super indicative, but he's played 26 games for 23 goals, just under a goal a game and a couple of tackles a game as well. Um, I do know that in his Colts year though at Subiaco, who's averaging up near five tackles a game for, for the position he plays, that is pretty elite. So hopefully we can tap into that sort of uh, attribute where he's busy in the forward line and, and creating pressure and opportunistic and he, from what I can see he can be pretty crafty around goals but he's not one of those players that's going to regularly bend goals in from the pocket he's going to be in the right place at the right time snap a goal uh, create a contest whatever um, so from that point of view I think there's a chance he comes in and improves the dynamic of our young forward line so does he come in from day one and play does he play round one uh, maybe um, trying to map it out what our forward line is and we'll talk about Matthew Flynn as well uh, because he is going to be involved with the forward line mix uh, and what I mean by that is uh, obviously we recruited him as a free agent the logic behind that was Bailey Williams played the full season this year as the number one ruck Nick Nat Nui unfortunately just didn't get up the, the plan was Nat Nui number one ruck Williams second ruck and forward Williams played the entire year as a ruckman and to be honest did a fantastic job I, I can't remember exactly where he finished in the BNF uh, but he would have been not far off the top five certainly in the top ten he had a, had a really good year for what we were asking of Bailey Williams I, I've been very impressed I'm a big supporter of Bailey but Evidently, we've looked at that ruck mix with Nick Nat going out and we've decided let's let's bolster a little bit with a mature ruckman, uh, 26-year-old Matthew Flynn at GWS who can't quite crack a regular game because Kieran Briggs at GWS has, uh, well, he, he shot to prominence this year. He's a very good young ruckman of the competition and Matthew Flynn's available. We offered him a three-year deal uh, with the promise of, you know, at least a start. We're going to give you a fair bit of game time to try and uh, establish a, a, a long-term partnership in the ruck. That would be that would be ideal from a West Coast point of view while we have Barnett um, develop and Jamison's maybe as well. So, so the impact of Matthew Flynn coming to the side, who I think will start round one, all things being equal, uh, is that Bailey Williams will also then uh, push forward and be part of this tall forward rotation now it's going to be tricky to map out exactly how our forward line is going to work so there's a few staples we'll start with the talls Oscar Allen's going to be in that team. Jack Dallin's going to be in that team if fit. Um, and we'll talk about some rumors about that in a second. But uh, Jack Dallin and Allen. And then, you know, there's a third tall spot up for grabs. And, you know, I think this is a tough one. Ryan Marrick is one of those young talents that we should probably be giving every opportunity to, to develop in the AFL side. I think he's a clear AFL talent. Um, the other one is Jake Waterman, who... He can have a bit of a mixed opinion on him from, from West Coast fans. I think what we saw at the start of this season was a player that's ready to take his game to the next level and uh, played some really, really good footy for us at the start of the year. I think it was four against GWS and there was other games where I just thought, wow, this guy has really matured as a footballer. Unfortunately, with Jake Waterman is, if you don't remember, he got struck down with a really bad illness in the middle of the year. Uh, it was like some sort of bowel infection and uh, there was genuine threat to his career. So Jake Waterman, I think he lost 10 kilos. He's going to have to slowly build that back. Long story short, Jake Waterman's probably not going to be ready for round one, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, but either way, it's probably a battle of Waterman versus Marrick. You add in Williams as a fourth tall there, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be a pretty tall forward line. So those are all spots for which Brockman is not competing. So there's probably about three, maybe four spots left in the best 22. So Cripps is a mainstay, uh, Ryan's a mainstay, and I think Noah Long's probably a mainstay at this point when you consider as well the need to develop these kids. So there's another pressure forward spot probably up for grabs and I'm probably forgetting someone. How I think it will go is that Brockman will be given every opportunity to uh, to be in the mix for round one. Um, you know, if he cracks a game for Hawthorne, he's probably going to crack a game for us. But we did have a lot of injuries this year. It gets a little bit messy trying to, uh, trying to compare it exactly like that. But I expect Brockman to be in the team for the preseason games. You know how there's always like a, a best 22 Eagles and then there's the uh, a reserves Eagles, so to speak. That's probably about his ranking in the squad. 
he'll be on the fringes of the team and if he has a good preseason he plays round one so we've been expected to take four picks in this year's draft and uh, essentially we've just given one up for a 20 year old in Tyler Brockman who is um, you know in theory like a more safe bet than whoever we're going to take a pick 44 so from that point of view, it's uh, it's a sound move, and Matthew Flynn for free as a free agent is also a sound move. They were both n- uh, moves we needed to make, but the, for the rest of this off season, we might be looking at a, at a pretty quiet period here because um, I, 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 even on this channel I've covered it. But over the last few weeks, we've seen rumors about Elliot Yo. Jack Darling, and most recently Liam Duggan. I couldn't even find that rumor anywhere. I just saw people talking about it. Apparently it was tweeted. Apparently the people were saying that Will Schofield called into Trade Radio and talked about Liam Duggan, uh, but then I also later read that it was misidentified. It wasn't Will Schofield at all. The Eagles have come out and categorically quashed any rumor of that, which doesn't mean that clubs didn't um, approach those players. There's no way of guaranteeing necessarily that North Melbourne weren't interested in Jack Darling, that the Gold Coats weren't interested in Elliot Yo. but were West Coast actually considering them? Probably not in terms of deals. And the West Australian was very opportunistic with this and posted an article saying uh, Jack Darling could be part of pick one negotiations. That, that probably is a bit irresponsible. That was a little bit made up. But it is silly season and we know that those deals are not going to happen now. So what happens for the rest of the trade period? Well, I think we're going to sit back a little bit and probably just see what offers we can get for pick one. It was reported as part of this Brockman deal that Hawthorne offered pick four this year their future first round pick, which is probably going to be in the top six to eight, depending on how you rate Hawthorne's potential improvement next year. So uh, so pick four, pick eight, and Tyler Brockman, and that was rejected. So at least we get a little bit of insight as to what the Eagles view as a potential attractive deal. And it makes me think that Melbourne probably won't have uh, what it takes to stump up a deal. I'm not ruling out North Melbourne yet because uh, there was a bit of a big footy rumor. The Eagles met with Colby McKercher really recently down in Tasmania. He's the likely number two pick. So the Eagles are probably just doing their due diligence. And uh, I'd say if we do deal Harley Reid or if we do deal pick one, then the opportunity to draft Colby McKercher needs to come back to us. I think that is going to be the minimum. But we'll see what happens as every day goes past. I, I keep changing my mind for a start, but I do think the Eagles are potentially very, very happy with keeping one, uh, one and taking Harley Reid. But we won't know until November, which is the frustrating part. So it leaves us with uh, picks 1, 23, 37, and then 50-something. 50 50-something. 50 um, say, say things stay the same as they are right now, we've got pick 1, Harley Reid. So we've picked up Brockman, we've picked up Flynn, a couple of role players. Um, we in terms of this rebuild and regenerating our young list, it, as far as Harley Reid goes, it's hard to argue that there's a better way to add top-end talent to your list. He's probably the one, best number one prospect we've ever seen. You know what, if we flip that for two, I still think that we've done a pretty good job of getting Colby McCurcher in. So I, I don't think we can lose from that point of view. But let's say we hold the picks as they are. 23 and 37 will probably be the other two live picks. Now, they're not juicy picks because 23 probably becomes 29. Uh, 35, I'm not even sure. That might actually stay about the same because other picks get absorbed when bid, uh, academy bids happen. So, you know, 29 and th- let's call it 37. Um, we need to be shrewd with these picks. And there's a lot of water to go under the bridge in terms of, um, you know, what players are likely to be there. But what I will say is that over the last few years, I've pretty, been pretty happy with our picks around that range. You know, um, Hoff was pick 31, Bazo was pick 37. Uh, both players that I consider an important part of our future. Jack Williams was pick 52, I think. And, um, you know, whatever your thoughts are on him, he played seven games or six games at the end of this year. So if pick 52 is already probably above the benchmark. Then more recently, we got Barnett and Burgio, and they're, they're a little bit too early to tell. But players are around that talent. If we can pick those to support Harley Reid, and, uh, and Brockman and Flynn, then hopefully we are in a better space by the end of this trade period than we were at the start of it. Our fourth pick in this draft, I think that will be the last pick that we take. I don't think we're going to take five now that we've traded 44. Um, how that works is we've got a few next generation academy talents in this draft. So one of them's Lance Collard. He's probably not going to last that long. There's Cohen Livingston and there's Oscar Heim Bastion and a few others that are escaping me right now. Um, so the logic behind that is if we can match any bids that come for those players after pick 40. So let's say Cohen Livingston gets bid on at 45. Potentially, we could match with pick 57. He becomes our fourth national draft pick. I think we'll go into the rest of the offseason one player short on our list. The benefit is we keep a spot open for the midseason draft. And you know what happens over the last two midseason drafts? We had pick one, and we took Jai Cully and Ryan Marrick. So, you know, in recent times, 
the mid-season draft has been a viable way of accessing talent for us. I think I'm really happy with the picks we made. Um, Ryan Marrick more so than Jai Cully. Obviously, he's recovering from an ACL. Fingers crossed on his development. But either way, that is the way that I see the strategy going. I think we'll take our four picks and we'll leave a spot open for the mid-season draft and um, and then we'll go from there. But anyway, guys, I didn't plan this video at all. Uh, I didn't write anything down, so I'm hoping I didn't ramble too much, but I hope you got something out of it. And um, yeah, let me know in the comments, uh, Eagles fans or otherwise, what do you think uh, of the Eagles move so far and, and potentially what they should do with the picks that they have. So as always, I appreciate your support on the channel and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.